Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio. I'm your host, Deborah Bailey. And when I started this show in 2008, I was on a mission to promote women-owned businesses and help women succeed by providing resources and valuable tips from other women and men, small business owners. In each interview, my guests speak openly about their triumphs, the scary times, and tough decisions they have to make along the way. Women Entrepreneurs Radio is about showing women how to harness their natural strengths to achieve success on their own terms. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio, and I am your host, Deborah Bailey. I'm really glad that you could join me today. And if you are listening to this on uh, Podomatic or um, iTunes, which uh, is another place that you can find it, you can also find the show on iHeartRadio and Spotify, uh, along with a few other platforms. So you can go to Women Entrepreneur Secrets and click on the podcast uh, menu. And you can see all the different platforms that the show is available on. So more than likely, one of them will be one that you uh, like to frequent. And if you have a moment or two, I would really appreciate it if you can leave a review if you're on iTunes, because it always helps the show be found by more listeners. So any kind of feedback you can share there is wonderful. Or you can also uh, click on the contact um, button on the blog, womenentrepreneurseekers.com, and leave your feedback there as well. Or if you have any suggestions for topics of future shows, or if you're also interested in being a guest, there's information there for you as well. So also, if you can check out my website, dbaileycoach.com, you'll learn more about what I'm up to and my services uh, for book coaching. And my fiction blog is brightstreetbooks.com, and you can learn more about my books and where to purchase them and different uh, summaries there so you can know what I've uh, been writing about uh, for a while now. So I hope that you'll check that out as well. So I think that is all that um, I want to mention before we get started. So my guest today is Sarah Oliviari, and she has over 16 years of experience working in and leading nonprofit organizations. After several years serving as a deputy director and executive director, Sarah started her own for-profit business in 2005. Pivot Ground is on a mission to get nonprofits optimized, organized, and thriving. Sarah uses her skills and knowledge of the nonprofit sector to help increase capacity, deliver better programming, attract more funding, and hopefully make the world a little better. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Well, before we get started to get a little bit more into what you're doing, I uh, really would like to find out your journey. How did you decide to get started on what you're doing now? Sure. Well, my journey has kind of come full circle because I started out um, my professional career really working in nonprofits. And um, after a journey that went through um, building websites and then doing marketing and then doing marketing for nonprofits, I came back to helping nonprofits run better, but this time I am on the outside um, looking in and helping executive directors um, run their nonprofits better. Mm -hmm. So is that what inspired you to decide, you know, you're going to do this and leave that, that executive director position? Um, well, you know, it wasn't so linear. <laughs> it never is. Right. Yeah. Um, so I had been an executive director and I, I had lost my job, my last job as deputy director directly because of the economic downturn. Mm -hmm. Um, literally a spouse lost her job, which caused the other half to have to work more in the nonprofit, which had to reduce my role. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was like, you know, it's just like, oh, here we go. Yeah. And at the time, I was, um, I had just published um, Lesson Planning a la Carte, which is a book that I co-authored 
um, about uh, lesson planning in the classroom. I had also just finished getting my master's degree in humanistic multicultural education, mm -hmm. and I had just gotten married. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, what do we do now? <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> right, a lot, you know, it, it always comes in, in big chunks, life. Right, right. Um, so at the time, my husband had wanted to start a video production company. And I had, you know, in running these nonprofits, I had started, founded a nonprofit, which was actually a school, so I was familiar with setting up that kind of business. And I, one of the nonprofit jobs I'd had was being the first executive director of a foundation. Um, so mm -hmm. I took those skills and was like, okay, I'll help my husband at the time um, set up this business. And, and I did, and I quickly found myself running it. Um, mm -hmm. And all the while, I was building websites on the side, which was, um, and doing some digital marketing at that point, which was a par an industry that didn't really suffer as much in the town downturn. In fact, you know, when things get hard for businesses, they often turn to mm -hmm. marketing to kind of get a better edge. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that, and I did it on the so quote air quotes on the side. <laughs> I was supporting our entire family doing it, mm -hmm. and finally I said okay, I'm going to call this my job. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, right. And, but I still didn't feel like a business owner, even though I was on paper, um, not just for my kind of freelance work, but with my husband. And then that kind of video production business, which he'd started, kind of phased out, and he got very interested in starting an art supply store and cafe. Mm -hmm. Again, I said, I'll help you set it up. And before I knew it, I was managing a lot of it. Um, and... And that I learned so much about business doing that. I learned about, you know, kind of food service with the cafe. We didn't have a full kitchen, but we had mm -hmm. the art supply store. I dealt with inventory and seasonal inventory and distributors. And so I learned so much more there. All the while, though, I was still doing these websites and marketing, quote, on the side. But that's where the money was coming from. Mm -hmm. And I got an opportunity to do a large project. It was actually with a nonprofit. And it was a project that was beyond my technical experience, but mm -hmm. very much within my scope of ability to frame the project, know what it was, simply because of my nonprofit background and my nature for being able to problem solve and organize things. And it was in that project they said, okay, I'm going to take this on, but this is going to push me into an agency model because I'm going to have to have other people. I'm going to have to have a development team working on this complicated website project. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I started doing some research, and that's when I started reaching out. I followed some people online, people who were freelancers, um, people who were teaching freelancers, teaching people with web businesses. And... Um, and so I got started getting a little more serious about business and, and more, you know, thinking about how I was going to grow it. I had gotten this big contract. And not too long after that, um, there was a mastermind program that I was thinking about enrolling in. And at the time, spending money on support for my business was like the most important possibly hard thing I could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, we had very little money at the time, uh, even though I had this big contract because the other business that my husband was running was losing money. So pretty much everything I made just went right out the door. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, like I'm not, I, I'm going to have to pay for help because I know I need it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did. And shortly after that, I got into that program. I actually ended up leaving my husband. We had a two-year-old son at the time. And so I went on this journey of getting separated and being coming very intentional about what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I had learned two key things about success in business. I had learned from my nonprofit days, I had learned about iteration, that like it's about you got to keep staying in the game. Don't quit. But also mm -hmm. just keep learning from your mistakes. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Keep, you know, just take everything that's a failure, take it in, learn it. Everything that's a success, you know, also take that in and improve on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then in getting separated, I started to really learn about 
you could call it the power of a, 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 um, intention or just kind of being able to stick to a plan or follow advice um, in one person. I think about that is our capacity to move forward is can we really kind of stick to it? Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, I learned a lesson, a piece of advice that I now share whenever when anybody asks me, what's your favorite piece of advice? I say, finding great advice is pretty easy. It's following it that's hard. <laughs> yeah, that resonates. Yeah, with you, huh? yeah that's really good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but so I was starting to follow good advice, and then I had a third lesson, which kind of really brought it together for me, and it was a lesson about what focus and clarity really can bring. And so I, I had kind of focus in my business. I knew at that point the, the ma business mastermind told me I needed a niche. I figured out nonprofits was it because I really understood nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that I needed to, you know, build a business that I loved doing and build a business that was maybe not just me. I knew I was building an agency. And then this amazing um, two events happened in almost the same day. I think it was the same day. It feels like the same day. Um, I had had one, a business training session where they were teaching us. They're actually running through the numbers of basically why you can't really grow a profitable business as a solopreneur, as a freelancer. You have to hire or contract out other people to do different parts of your business and have mm. yourself doing the part you're best at. Mm -hmm. And so that was a powerful lesson. And then in that same day or week, I had been to a divorce mediation session and was sent home with some homework to draft up what my proposed schedule with my son would be. So basically how I was going to share the time with my son now with my mm -hmm. ex. And so because I'd run those numbers, I said, you know, I really want to spend all of the time that I do have on the schedule with my son, mm -hmm. really with, with him. I don't want right. to be putting, in him, putting him in extra care or not really being present. And so I did the reverse calculations. And I basically, how many hours do I have in a week to work if I spend all of this time with my son and still take enough quality time to be present for um, him mm -hmm. <laughs> when I'm with him? Mm -hmm. And it was 28 and a half hours. And that's not a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got that focus. If I have to build a business that is meaningful to me, which means helping nonprofits. And I also then I did the math around how much did I need to live on. And be, I was sharing physical custody of my son, but I had 100% of the financial burden for raising him. Mm -hmm. And I had no retirement savings and nothing in the bank at the time. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. added up how much I'd mm -hmm. need to make. And it surprised me how much it was. It was $120,000 a year, roughly, that I needed to be able to take out of my business. Mm -hmm. And so then I had, I started, I got like actual, like really, really focused with those three things. Business that serves nonprofits has to generate for me, in addition to its other expenses, $120,000. And mm -hmm. I can't work on it more than 28 and a half hours a week. Wow. <laughs> and that focus combined with the iteration and the, you know, sticking to the plan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that started to propel me forward into growing Pivot Ground in a way that I had never had. I started to call myself an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. call myself a business owner, and I felt that I was really beginning to gain some momentum, that I really had something there. Wow. <laughs> That's really something because you were going through so much at the time, and yeah. now you have to focus on this other in building this business. You know, sometimes I think when we're so busy, it causes us to really get clear, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. on how to move forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was no wiggle room. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, during that year that I was doing that, I moved four times. Mm -hmm. um, I had to end up taking over the business that my husband had had that was losing money and li and essentially liquidate it, turn the losing money down to a trickle and mm -hmm. deal with the, it was almost $20,000 in debt. So there was no wiggle room. <laughs> right, right. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and even though that's 
you know, you, you might think of it in the, oh, that's hard. And sure it was. Mm -hmm. um, it created the kind of conditions that success is born out of. And I think there are so many stories of people turning personal struggle into mm -hmm. success because, yes. because it creates no wiggle room. You put The more you put constraints on things, mm -hmm. the more you actually start to be creative and think out of the box and propel forward. That's true, though. I think that's that's really, really true. And, and certainly you could see that in, in everything you were going through and you were able to get all these things going and keep them going um, at the same time. It seems like really I'm just trying to take all that in right now because that has to have been so much to have to really say, OK, this is on me uh, to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I have that. Someone was asking me today, like, you know, how I or earlier this week, how I deal with hard times. And I was like, mm -hmm. I've learned through necessity that they're getting anxious about it only makes it harder. Mm. And you just have to like the, mm -hmm. the more that's going on, the more you have to focus in, look at the big picture, make a plan and then put on your blinders and just focus on your very next step. Mm -hmm. And then once you've taken that, Look at your next step after that. And occasionally look up and look around. Mm -hmm. But if you keep looking at the big picture when it's complicated all the time, you're just going to feel like you're drowning. Yes, that's true. That's great advice, too. That's the, the way to be overwhelmed. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. that is yes. the way to be overwhelmed. Because yeah. it's too much. You, you're like, no, I can't do this. <laughs> but how you did it, and, and the focus is really the key to – moving forward and also what you mentioned about if you really want to grow your business it's I would think really hard to try to do all that and just be one person and you're saying focusing on what you really are good at what your excellence is or however you want to describe it is really the way to go and I, I think that's a good thing to state because so many people think they have to do everything Right. And I think a lot of times women take that on as well, that I have to do it all and I have to do it all perfectly. And that's another way to drown underneath everything. Absolutely. And yeah. I felt that as a woman, you know, like, oh, I got caretaking and this and that. Yeah. And this and that. Um, you know, and, and there were times in that journey, you know, when I started to make a little more money, I, my eating had gotten weird because I mm -hmm. wasn't leaving enough time for like, I like to cook. But I didn't have mm -hmm. enough time to buy groceries and make a meal. Right. Yeah. And so I started yeah. making weird meals with weird food or eating <laughs> out too much because um, I didn't have proper ingredients. <laughs> so for a bit, I did one of those cooking subscriptions, um, uh -huh. which helped. And then I was I cook I actually cooked, um, but the groceries were delivered. You know, so right. each time though that something like that came up, and I was like, this is weird. Like I try to come up with some solution that really fixed it. For me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it's those yeah. little things that, you know, I hear sometimes people are like, oh, well, this little thing, it's only going to save you a little bit of time. But that time adds up. Yes. And even more than that, that mental space adds yeah. up. Yeah. Yes. That, that cannot be underestimated <laughs> because <laughs> it's the mental and emotional things that are going on at the same time that really can take so much. Uh, create so much stress for yeah. people. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. And these days, um, I don't work Fridays. No okay. And um, we now have a new goal um, by probably within the next three years, but maybe starting next year if we can swing it, that I won't work more than 15 hours a week mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually 10. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what? The, the less I work, the more we get done in the mm. business because my strength at pivot ground really is in like I've created this framework for nonprofits it's called the impact method mm. and when I free up my time I free up my thinking space and when I have more free time I generate new things that we can do for our clients new ways to improve the impact method I have kind of mental breakthroughs mm -hmm. and I wouldn't I don't have them when my time is all filled up Mm, that's a great point. Yes, I like that, actually. And that, again, is, is a real good 
thing to emphasize because how many people think that they have to either appear to be busy because that's very much what I learned in corporate, the idea of appearing to be busy, even if you're really not, and kind of saying being busy is also being productive, which is not true. Right. You know, I heard, I forget where I read this, but it was talking about like culture, work culture differences between the U.S. and Europe. Mm -hmm. and, and it was pointing out how in the U.S. we say, you know, oh, I've been, I'm really busy as mm -hmm. like a success indicator. Yeah. And in Europe, they say like, oh, I took so many vacations this year. As a <laughs> and that really hit home for me. And yeah. you know, sometimes I tell people I'm busy because I feel busy, but mm -hmm. that's busy in like, my days are full, like I'm using my brain, but I'm working like 9.30 to 2.30 or 3. <laughs> I'm not working on Fridays and I'm busy doing, I'm a, I'm a, a sailor, I do sailboat racing, and so mm -hmm. I'm busy doing those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and I still sometimes say it because I don't want people to think I'm a total slacker, but, <laughs> but I try, I'm so conscious of it. Like I try to be like, you know, I'm very fulfilled right now or like there's some intense things like mm -hmm. that are exciting that are happening. Um, but, you know, to be busy, you know, yes, we fill our time um, with different things. But I, I hope I think that at this point my time is filled with with meaningful things and not, um, and I'm able to stop. I think that's one of the key things right now. So the way where we've gotten to with pivot ground, um, is eventually I'm needed, but I could probably stop on a dot. Like I could drop, drop the ball right now and mm -hmm. go away for three weeks and come back and, and everything would still be going. Wow. That's great. And in fact, I had that, you know, like life pushes us into testing those boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a week that my son didn't have school and he got the flu and I just couldn't work. Um, mm -hmm. And my um, this woman, Sonia, who helps me run the business, um, she's fantastic. And she just picked up and she played me. Um, she couldn't do client consulting calls, but she ran the whole rest of the business. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have an assistant as well. Um, so between the two of them, they do so much of the business um, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's not, it is not all me, which is what I wanted. That's what right. I tried to build, right? right? <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's what you were creating. And that's what feels yeah. good. I mean, I recommend that so many people, I hear this story, they build a business thinking that it will give them freedom. Mm -hmm. And it is very easy to build a business that locks you up. Mm. Um, you have to be quite intentional to mm -hmm. build a business that, that gives you freedom. Mm. That's another, another great point to make because that it really is the buzzword. And the thing is, are people really creating that kind of business or as you said, are they locking themselves up because then they realize they can't step away and yeah. there's so many hours and, and they're burning out. So yeah, you really do have to be intentional about what it is you want to create. Yeah. And there are moments, yeah. you know, in starting a business where you have to hustle and you mm -hmm. are doing those things, but you have to know, like have the plan. Like yes. I hustled to get the next employee mm -hmm. <laughs> so <I could laughs> offload things. Um, mm -hmm. there was always a plan for like, I know that I'm going to take myself right up to capacity and a little mm -hmm. bit over, but mm -hmm. this is all part of a very specific plan that involves relieving me of being over capacity. Mm -hmm. you don't plan for that. Mm -hmm. You'll just get over mm -hmm. capacity and you'll have no wiggle room to get out of it and you'll have to backtrack. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's, it's the planning that really is the key. Yeah. Well, and not that. profits. Nonprofits suffer from that a lot. I see a lot of nonprofits and like they're literally like we're stuck. We, we can't mm. really move any direction. And it's because they've gone over capacity mm -hmm. without planning for their own growth or planning. Mm -hmm. for mm. And that that's also very interesting because of, there are people who I talk to who want to create a nonprofit, but they may not really know how to go about that. Uh, they may have trouble trying to find that information or they may feel that they have this intention to do this thing to help others, but they don't really know how do I put some structure around that? Yeah. 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 So that makes a lot of sense that, that you are serving those people that may not really know how to now 
be productive and, and get this thing going. Yeah, and nonprofits yeah. actually need a lot of structure. They need more structure start uh, right from the startup phase than a for-profit business because mm -hmm. a nonprofit is required to have a board, um, and typically the minimum requirement is three board members. So at the very minimum, you are a business of three. Mm -hmm. Most, most mm -hmm. you know, entrepreneurs start out, they can just be a business of one. It's very easy to kind of have a plan. You can have a plan in your head if it's mm -hmm. just you. If mm -hmm. there's two people, you really need it on paper yeah. so the two of you can know who's doing what. You know, you tag team. Mm -hmm. And once there are three, you are looking at, you know, you'd think that three is three times one person, but it's not. Mm -hmm. A business of three is actually the, you know, each person on their own, so that's the three. Mm -hmm. And then each pair of two, that's three more, so that's six. And then all three working together at once, so that's seven. So mm -hmm. you've just grown your business seven times. <laughs> the difference mm -hmm. between a one person and a three person right. or is seven times. And it goes, each person you add, that goes up exponentially. So you mm -hmm. need those systems in a nonprofit. There are just more people and mm -hmm. you can't keep those people all on the same page and each kind of doing a discrete chunk and not stepping on each other's toes. Mm. You don't have some really great systems in place for dividing up the work and being in communication about who's doing what. Mm -hmm. Yes, and of course that, that makes, again, makes perfect sense because then otherwise there's people maybe doing some of the same things or maybe even not going in the same direction because you don't have the communication, you don't have the system. So yeah, that, that's a great example. So why that is so important. And I think a lot of what we're talking about, the stages you've been through, in terms of being an entrepreneur and being an employee, being a freelancer, being the CEO, as far as making these moves and transitions, how would you say that your mindset has changed? Um, I've always had a very abundant mindset. I've always been an extremely positive person. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely gained along the way that um, I've always been calm in, in a chaotic situation, but I really like now I'm really familiar with the challenges. And though each time the challenges are new, I go, oh, yeah, I've been here before. <laughs> I remember there was a point where um, I was starting to really grow my business, but, you know, we ran out of money. And I said, you know, at first, at first, running out of money was terrifying. And mm -hmm. then I reached this point. I said, I see my growth trajectory, trajectory, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to run out of money four more times before I just stop running out of money. <laughs> and at that point, I knew, like, okay, I, I get this growth thing. It's this up and down thing, and I'm now I'm expecting it. Mm. <laughs> and sure enough, time four has now hit and gone. And mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, we might get close again, but I don't think that is happening again. That, that, mm -hmm. <laughs> like we are past that point. Um, but you hear big, you know, big companies success, you know, who like they go up into the millions and then mm -hmm. boom, they're down. They're like, you know, totally mm -hmm. broke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I got used to things like that and, and start learn to expect them. Mm. <laughs> Then you really don't freak out when you wreck my mind because you're like, oh, yeah, this is the time. Right. Before. Like, we're going to do this again, too. <laughs> it's not just going to be bad now. It's going to be bad again. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Well, like I said, these are things I'm so glad that you're saying because people need to hear this. And these are things that you, a lot of times people don't hear when they're starting out. They, they don't hear that these peaks and valleys happen or the running out of money thing happens. They're just hearing, oh, everything just keeps going up. And so I'm glad when someone is saying, look, these are things you really have to look at and plan for. That's so important. Yeah, I read a great book on on startups. I'm gonna, I can't remember the title or the author right now, so I'm very sorry to the author of this book. But basically he talks about Th this growth cycle, which is up and down and up and down. He said the secret to mastering that is to um, minimize the lows and optimize mm -hmm. the highs. And so basically mm -hmm. it's know the no low is coming. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you can, um, you know, to lower the blow, but also like 
boost your expectations so you don't feel so bad. You know that this is part of the process. It's inevitable. Right. And then optimize the highs. When it gets good, don't get so excited that you spend all your money. Know right. that low is coming. Put something away. You know, say what, you know, okay, let me leverage this moment, but don't over leverage it. Plan mm. for the next low because it's mm -hmm. going to be coming. There are going to be a lot of lows <laughs> before you start to hit <laughs> a stable business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good stuff to to share and for people to really hear. Because as, as I said, that's not always the message that's put out there for people just starting up. Yes, yes, it definitely it's really important to know that. I think another thing I would share that's important to know is, um, you know, I said I was so afraid to spend this money on this first business course that I paid for. Mm -hmm. I put, it was twenty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I put it on a credit card. I didn't have the money. And I just didn't see any way, but I was like, I can't believe I'm spending this kind of money <laughs> to get some help. Like, whoo, this is good. but it paid off. And then mm -hmm. I learned as I got more involved with more business people and, and leveled up with the kind of business people I was talking with, oh, the better business people, they spend money on mentors and better mentors. They're always looking for a support that is a level above where they are, mm -hmm. they are at and who yes. can their business, you know. So, you know, then before I knew it, I spent $8,000 on support. <laughs> and then before I knew it, I'd spent $15,000 mm -hmm. And when I, you know, when I got to that level, it was no longer like, oh, I'm a kitchen. Am I really going to do this? It was like, yes, this is going <laughs> to pay off in a second. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and to this day, that's, you know, outside of um, p hiring people to help do things for me, the number one thing that I spend money on is support to take me to the next level. And I consistently get a great return on those investments. Mm -hmm. And that's a great idea. And I think also what you're saying here is also important because you, you're you saying that you started at a certain point and then as you went on, you may be uh, lining up with other mentors who may be you now at this next level and next level. And I, I think it's really important to, to emphasize that because there are a lot of times people just walk into business and then there's someone saying, oh, you've got to pay me X amount before I think this person is really ready to go there. Mm -hmm. And then they people who are maxing out the cards to get knowledge that maybe they're not ready for yet. Um, yeah, so true. So like, right, following the advice is hard. So test the waters mm -hmm. um, and see how you do. Like mm -hmm. start by reading a book. And if you can basically like, you know, take something away from that book, maybe you've made a $12 investment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe you can use right. that book to get $20 back or you right. probably get $200 back if you're <laughs> diligent. If you're good mm -hmm. like me and you really are used to sticking to good advice, <laughs> you can read a book and make thousands of dollars. Off. Um, but many people are like they need some skin in the game, right? Yes. You need to put some cash down so that you really stick to that plan. Yes. Um, right. And so paying for something, you know, it's like I advise people like don't don't go hungry, but it should hurt. <laughs> like <laughs> the amount of money you put in, it should definitely hurt because that's going to give you what you need to follow the advice that's coming. Mm. And to a certain level, you know, those mm -hmm. people who are higher up, um, they cost more. And, and right. most people who are ready for that can afford that. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, yes, I didn't have $2,500, but I did have that kind of limit on my credit card, which is not that high, <laughs> but I had that and I probably made that money back in three months. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, a great investment. It was a fantastic investment. Mm -hmm. And then I used that learning and made, you know, many times over my investment. I probably made, um, I would, I've never calculated exactly, but probably made, you know, twenty five to $30,000 off that $2,500 investment mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. that learning. Right. So that's definitely worth worthwhile. <laughs> well, yes, and having mentors who ha can really help you to get to these levels is key because you really aren't doing this by yourself. You really need to have, have that um, guidance, I would say, and support to really help you now to, to step up. So I think that's also extremely important.
Yeah, and you know, I think another thing, you know, a mistake that I made or, or ignorance that I had um, was that for a long time, especially when I was working in nonprofits, a mindset that changed is I thought that I had didn't have money, but I had time. Mm -hmm. And I, it took me a while to really understand how much going slow costs. You mm -hmm. miss out on so much opportunity. And I, I was talking to somebody earlier today about, um, you know, this poverty mindset in nonprofits. And I think nonprofits are so worried about, you know, oh, we shouldn't, you know, we can't be spending money. We can't be spending money. Right. Meanwhile, they're moving so slowly because they're not spending money. Mm -hmm. They're actually just losing money like crazy out the other side mm -hmm. in this opportunity. And when you pay for a mentor or a course that, that's really the right course for you, uh, and I shouldn't say a course. It's really you need to work with an expert who can look at your business and tell you what you can't see so that you can move forward fast mm -hmm. and, um, and tell you, you know, these are your next 10 steps or however many it is um, because you, d you don't want to go slow. You really do need to go fast. It saves money in the long run. Um, and going slow can lead you to just completely, um, you know, diminish your business to nothing. Right. And, and maybe people are afraid and, and they feel like, oh, we can't make that move. We can't, make the investment and that sounds like that's what freezes them up from taking those leaps. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the fear of the growth and what you have to do, but then that can work against you because you really need to take those leaps at, at some point. <laughs> you, <really Right>. <laughs> you can't just sit there forever. That's, that's really so true. So, Sarah, could you please share with everyone where they can find out more about you and, and your business? Sure. Um, you can go to our website, pivotground.com. Um, you can also find Pivot Ground on Facebook. Just search for Pivot Ground. You can find me, Sarah Livieri, on LinkedIn. And if you are an executive director of a nonprofit listening to the show, we have a Facebook group. Uh, called Executive Directors Ready to Thrive. It is free and we are answering questions. I'm in there giving extra tidbits of advice all the time and we are talking about um, the kinds of decisions that you're faced with every day that you can't necessarily talk to everybody else about like mm -hmm. financial leadership and making data-driven decisions which is relatively easy in a for-profit business and extremely hard in a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, and and other issues like that how to deal with your board and it's a safe place to come and ask questions and um, challenge the status quo if it's not working for you wonderful oh that's great so also, I want to ask you about your pay structure is profit sharing for your employees. So could you share a little bit about that and, and how you set that up? Sure. Um, it's, it's continually in evolution as we evolve um, the business. But I was very inspired by a book that I read called The Great Game of Business. And the great game of business really talks about the value of open bookkeeping. And that's basically where you share your profit and loss statements with your employees and you mm -hmm. teach them all how to read these financial documents. And basically because when everybody's focused, so if you're a for-profit business, when everybody's focused on, you know, increasing your profit margin, that's basically how efficient you are at making money, you leverage people's entire thinking about how to improve the business so it does that. Mm. So at Pivot Ground, we, um, not everybody goes on profit sharing, but basically anyone, anyone who's in a seat, and we have our business charted out using the same tool we do for the nonprofits, we call it the nonprofit blueprint. It's a chart of all the functions in our company and who owns each function. So anybody who owns a function, meaning they have, they are empowered with decision making power, if they own a function that has to do with generating revenue, um, so if they're delivering a service, if they're in a marketing function, um, that kind of thing that somehow relates to getting the profit margin um, improved, then to me it makes sense to share that with them. So we share both the knowledge um, of what's going on with the money in the business, but we mm -hmm. also then 
share in the benefit. Um, it's an incentive, um, but also it just feels really right to me. Um, we've played with different percentages over time. Um, you know, you can do like a base pay plus a percentage. You could have a base play pay, sorry, with a bonus that's based on a percentage. Um, when we were first starting up and we were still really, so when you're, right, when you are going through those dips and running out of money completely, it's very hard to say like, oh, I'm going to have an employee because you don't necessarily have that cash flow to sustain payroll in that way. So I was extremely transparent with a few people who wanted to go where I was going with the business and said, okay, we're going to profit share a hundred, you know, it's a hundred percent, no base here. Um, so we're going to have some great months and you're going to take home a lot of money and then we're going to have some dry months and you're not going to take home any. Mm -hmm. So we just, we keep very open about it. And that was a great way. It allowed me to build the business in a way that I felt was fair to people. And one trick we did at that time was instead of just saying, oh, we made this much money, um, we delayed it to like two months back. So we took the money that we had made two months prior and calculated that, um, and that would make like this month's pay. Mm -hmm. um, so basically the, that reduced the surprises, right? So if we had a dry month, um, one of those months where we ran out of money, we knew two months in advance like that that was going to impact this, our salary coming home. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with money, I think I encourage people to be open with money. The, the worst mistake you can make with money is to surprise people. If you mm. have someone who's committed and loyal to growing your business with you or growing your nonprofit with you, they will stick with you through hard times as long as you don't surprise them. There's nothing worse than someone expecting to pay their bills this month with their paycheck and then, mm -hmm. oops, surprise, you're not getting paid or you're getting paid late. That's not, that does not work well. <laughs> right, right. Um, so we, so we made this system where it was like, okay, you know, we didn't make our numbers in two months. You know, you're not going to be getting a paycheck. So plan now um, while you still are. And then, mm -hmm. and then if it gets better the next month, everybody knows that that's, that's a one time thing and it's going to be better the next month. We already know mm -hmm. that in advance. So we eliminated the surprise that way. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I, and I got a lot of help. Um, in the end and, and in growing the business. I really think what you said there is, again, another another uh, excellent point about people not wanting to be surprised about what's going to happen with their money and their pay and being transparent about this is how things are going. I think that is so refreshing. I can't tell you. <laughs> That is so far removed from the corporate model of things where people may not know anything that's going on until the last minute and there yeah. seems to be such a desire to hide things and we can't tell anybody anything and it, then it creates such insecurity. It does. And, you know, I think with that insecurity, people assume usually worse. Yes. It. And so if you share, one – it's usually not as bad as people would have thought if you'd yes. hidden it. Two, mm -hmm. you instead of being like that person at the top who's like, oh, my God, my whole world's getting messed up and everyone's going to hate me, yes. you now have however many p people you have on your team, you have that many people who are highly motivated to fix it with you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think it's good, you know, not everybody's comfortable with this, but I, we share, we, everybody knows how much everybody's making. Everybody knows how, what everybody's paycheck is, um, what their salary is, what their rate is if they're a contractor. Um, even my contractors know, like, how much I pay other contractors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that makes some people nervous, but you know what? It really keeps a, our integrity high mm -hmm. because everybody, nobody is getting paid something stupid. <laughs> Nobody's getting paid something that's more than they're worth, and everybody knows if they're getting paid a lot that mm -hmm. that it's really that that person should be getting paid a lot. Everybody agrees. Right. <laughs> everybody sees the value that each person is bringing to the table, and there is a real honest dollar amount that is correlated with that. And so, nobody people don't necessarily mind that one person is making more than another because it is justified. Hmm. True. <laughs> That's all I can say. That is 
that is that is so true because again this this takes me back to uh when i was working at at t quite some time ago and there was a point where certain grade levels let's say got a certain bonus and everybody in that grade level is going to get this bonus but then after a while oh we're going to change this and and now it depends on quote unquote merit or you know however they want to um call it but then all that transparency started to go away and mm -hmm. now nobody really knows who's getting what and how do you decide and who decides and it creates this big smoke screen that people just aren't comfortable yeah and, and it's messy yes <laughs> yes and, and the alternative <laughs> is like worst case scenario people are like I want to make more money and then everybody else is like yeah, we want to make more money too. And then everyone's like, we should all be making money. How do we make more money? We make the business make more money. Right. And then boom, we're all focused on making the business <laughs> more money. And that's awesome for business. Yes. <laughs> and people are stepping up saying, what can I do? You know, like I actually, you know, I've had people step up who I didn't know that that was their superpower. And they just, because they said, what can I do? Um, or they said, I could do this even though you never right. thought I could, and then they're amazing at it. Um, right. And, right. And so, you know, it is really, it's so scary, and, and I think that probably corporate culture, and we're often, so many people are just so uncomfortable with money um, that they're like, ah, we shouldn't know, but there are so many benefits. And I recommend that everybody read The Great Game of Business because the company that figured out doing this they are one of the most profitable companies. I believe they're still around. Mm -hmm. um, they set a goal of um, that every employee would have enough money to own a home outright for their family and mm -hmm. donate to charities in their local communities. Wow. That's and amazing. this was not, this, this company was a um, tractor engine remanufacturing company so like they rebuilt tractor engines <laughs> this wow. is a you know blue collar um, factory type mm -hmm. business um, and the people who created this system um, basically a larger corporation was letting kind of this arm of the business go because it was losing money mm. they couldn't produce enough tractors fast enough and they basically started, they opened up the books to, to these factory workers on the floor, taught mm -hmm. them how to read the profit and loss statements, went over them weekly, and they went, you know, they like a hundred times their output um, wow. with no additional expense. Mm -hmm. um, because the people on the factory floor thought through, how could we do this better? And they all right. were, they were all gonna benefit and they were all focused on the same thing, and they did it. That's wow! That book sounds fantastic, and I think that would really be a good read for everybody to pick up because it, it is true. It's a, it's a team effort, even though it may sound like oh, when those platitudes that you <laughs> that you hear in these meetings, but it's true. If everybody's working together for the same goal, then you're really going to see something. But when you've got people hiding and this one doesn't know what this is, you know, this one's doing and people have their individual agendas, this is not the way to go at all. Um, right. Yeah. It's and if you're way. the leader of, you know, talk about growing a business you want, do you mm -hmm. want to be the business owner who when, you know, when you get in trouble, you're just drowning in an ocean by yourself? Or yeah. do you want to be the business owner who has an entire army who's ready to do whatever it takes to get done when things get hard? Like, hmm. I want to be the second one <laughs> every time. <laughs> well, this, yeah, I, I really like the idea of everybody being on the same page and feeling like they're all a part of something. That's that's really what you want to feel when you're in, in the workplace. A lot of people want to feel that way, and, and often, too often, they, they don't get the opportunity to feel that way. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I like what you're doing and what you put together. That it's, It sounds very, very powerful uh, for, for people to learn, and maybe that's something they can look at for themselves. It's just important to, to look at what works and what's good and what's positive and see how we could keep that going. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely, definitely. So Sarah, this has really been a wonderful conversation. I'm just 
you know, I'm listening so intently. I have to check to see how how long, how long we've been talking because I know that, um, you know, I'm sure that you have things you have to get back to. And, and I'm just appreciative that you could take the time to, to speak with me uh, today. But do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, you know, when it comes to, for those, you know, listeners who are starting a business or maybe you feel your business isn't working and you need to change it, you know, be, be brave. You have to take some risks, you know, follow, follow that good advice, take some steps, um, you know, and, and you can do it. I've never met anybody who didn't have couldn't move from where they are right now, no matter how hard that spot is, there is a step you can make. It might be a side step, but there is a step you can make that will lead you a little bit closer to your destination. Mm, wonderful advice. And hopefully we've learned to take good advice after listening to this, to this show. Hope we won't learn that if we haven't done that in the past. I think now's a great time to learn how to do that. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> so everyone, I know you enjoyed it. Please make sure you share it. Please make sure you share it with other uh, people you may know who are in the nonprofit space or if there's something you're thinking about, certainly uh, see what you can learn here. And um, as I said, share it on social media. Please uh, share your uh, feedback or reviews. That's much appreciated. So uh, once again, it's the Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. Thank you so much for joining me, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. You can also join in the conversation on Facebook.com slash Women Entrepreneurs and on the website, WomenEntrepreneurSecrets.com. And don't forget to listen in on DVCoach.Podomatic.com and on iTunes.